Let's say a spacecraft runs out of power far in deep space. It wouldn't fall in the traditional sense because there's no gravity. Newton once said that an object remains in motion unless acted upon by an external force. In our case, this external force is gravity. In other words, if there's nothing with gravity around, it would continue to move due to inertia. It would keep going the way it did, without us being able to change its trajectory or adjust it in any way. It would keep traveling through deep space, almost forever. Well, at least until radiation and cosmic rays destroy it. And unless some celestial body like an asteroid doesn't destroy it either. And, of course, unless it encounters something with a gravitational pull, like a planet or a star. The likelihood of all this depends on the location and trajectory of the spacecraft. Voyager 1 was launched by NASA in 1977. It's been on its journey for almost 50 years now. Right now, it's the farthest human-made object from Earth, more than 50 billion miles away. It's already very far from all our planets, and it's the first spacecraft to enter interstellar space. The vast, empty space that exists between stars in a galaxy. It's the space outside our solar system, where there are no planets, moons, or other objects associated with our Sun. However, it's still in our solar system. To leave it, Voyager 1 needs to bypass the Oort cloud, a big, icy collection of objects where all the comets in our solar system probably come from. It will take Voyager about 300 years to reach the inner edge of the cloud, and then about 30,000 years to bypass it. Voyager 1 has a special plate on board, like a message in a bottle. This plate is called the Golden Record. It's not really golden, it's actually a shiny gold color. On this plate, there are things that tell a story about Earth. It was created in case Voyager ever encounters any extraterrestrial beings. The record has greetings in different languages, music from Earth, and even the sounds of nature, like birds chirping and the wind blowing. As the distance between us increases, the signal strength from Voyager 1 weakens over time. Eventually, it may become too weak to be detected by our communication equipment. The power output of Voyager 1's engine also declines over time. It's slowly running out of fuel. When all its systems shut down, we will lose contact with the spacecraft. Voyager 1 will work until 2025. After that, it will continue its journey on inertia. Luckily, it was designed to last, and the chance that it will encounter anything on its way is very small. Considering this, it might even keep going for billions of years. One day, it might even reach other star systems and maybe even outlast our Sun. The same goes for Voyager 2. It will keep traveling until it reaches interstellar space, joining its twin brother. Voyager 2 will continue to send us scientific and systematic data for a while, even in interstellar space. However, it will also cease to function eventually, becoming a silent artifact drifting through the Milky Way. When there's something with gravity near the spacecraft, the inevitable happens. It falls onto that object. This is why out of the vast South Pacific Ocean beyond New Zealand lies a unique and intriguing place known as the Spacecraft Cemetery. Officially, it's called the South Pacific Ocean Uninhabited Area. It's located near Point Nemo, the most remote spot from any island. It serves as the final resting place for spacecraft that have completed their missions and reached their lifetime limit due to wear and tear. Sometimes, these larger spacecraft are too hefty to burn up during re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. In that case, they're directed to crash or splash down in this remote ocean location. This helps protect us from any potential harm during re-entry and impact. There are, however, some big problems with this place. Scientists are worried about the impact this spacecraft cemetery has on the ocean. When spaceships come back to Earth, they often spill chemicals. One of these chemicals is hydrazine, a dangerous rocket substance. Unfortunately, it might not completely burn up during re-entry, so it leaks out into the ocean, posing a threat not only to marine life, but to us as well. We made up some rules, both within countries and internationally, to stop this. 
However, it's not easy to figure out how risky it is for certain spacecraft to enter the cemetery. We can't say for sure how much of a substance is left after it enters the air. As for spacecraft that don't fall, they're often left in space as debris. This is what we call any man-made object orbiting Earth that's no longer useful. It's also very dangerous. There are over 27,000 pieces of space debris orbiting Earth at high speeds. All this puts human and robot missions at risk and harms spacecraft. As we mentioned, usually we get rid of space debris by trying to bring the crafts back to Earth. This makes them burn up when they re-enter due to high speeds and air pressure. This usually works with smaller objects. There are also riskier methods, like letting spacecraft break down themselves, or crash into other things, or blow up. These methods aren't great because they just make up even more debris, even if it's smaller. So now, scientists are trying to find new ways to get rid of retired spacecraft. For example, nets and magnetic arms. There's also a thing called reusable spacecraft. It's a space vehicle that's built to be used more than once. For example, space planes such as the Space Shuttle and the Dream Chaser, or capsules like the SpaceX Dragon. They're designed to launch, orbit, come back to Earth, and do it all over again. But it's important to make sure these spacecraft and their passengers or cargo stay safe during the return, which is quite hard to do. Reusable spacecraft have special systems to guide them back to Earth safely. The Space Shuttle, for example, had OMS pods, sort of special backpacks that help the spacecraft move and control its position in space. The SpaceX Dragon had its own engines to slow down and enter the atmosphere in a controlled way. They also have a heat shield to protect it during re-entry. The heat shield can be made of different materials, but they need to be tough and able to withstand multiple trips. Coming up with a heat shield that's both strong and lightweight is a bit of a challenge. Finally, if a spacecraft lands on a runway, it needs wings and landing gear. They also add weight. Some designs like lifting bodies or the delta wing of the space shuttle try to reduce the mass of these parts. After landing, the spacecraft might need some fixing up before it can go on its next adventure. This process can take a while, up to a year and it might not always be possible to use the spacecraft again if it's been fixed up. There's also a limit to how many times a spacecraft can be fixed and used again before it has to retire. Different spacecraft have different abilities to be reused. Finally, sometimes we can rescue a spacecraft or even remake and repurpose it. Voyager 2 is one of the examples. It had a little trouble with its radio in 1978 Engineers fixed it by using a backup system. Since then, it's been exploring our solar system for over 40 years. The Hubble Space Telescope is the most famous telescope we have, the grandfather of them all. However, it had a blurry start in 1990. The work wasn't done at all as expected. The pictures were of low resolution. Luckily, astronauts fixed it right in space in 1993. To do that, they used some corrective mirrors. Now it gives us fantastic views of the universe. As you can see, even in bad scenarios, there are many possible options to solve spacecraft-related problems. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.